my thoughts on Australia's asylum seeker policies are that they fundamentally miss the point um, in having a single-minded focus on deterrence. Uh, we strive only to give people who lack options one less option. Um, and that's a very unhelpful thing for us to be doing. Um, they, they, our policies misrepresent boats arriving as the problem when in fact they're a symptom of the problem. The underlying problem is that people need to get on them to access protection in the first place. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more throughout the course of the evening about what some more constructive approaches might be. So uh, I guess there are two ways you can think about reform, or the two ways that I think about reform. Uh, one is to, you've got to get rid of this, one of these sources of inconsistency in the policy mix. So you can reject the UN Convention, you can do that within a year, um, and try to process onshore and try to do that more strictly in order to maintain the current level of intake. I'm not saying you don't want to increase the current level of intake, but I'm saying that you could you could in principle do that. You, you, there's not only the option of increasing the intake, you could maintain the current level of intake but process onshore at, at much lower cost than the, uh, the current system. And it seems to me everyone would be better off. The asylum seekers would be better off and the Australian government would be better off because there'd be less costs uh, associated with that kind of uh, arrangement. The other way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, thinking about reform is just to be far more liberal in uh, admitting uh, asylum seekers to uh, get rid of this, uh, uh, get rid of this uh, program of trying to increase the generalised uh, cost of uh, getting to Australia, and uh, uh, my judgment is that has that that, that has not worked uh, particularly well in the past. Uh, Kevin Rudd tried it, and it had uh, bad consequences. I think the major political parties have no interest at all in pursuing that kind of option. Uh, so I'd look elsewhere for policy reforms rather, rather than uh, simply, simply saying, well, we're going to uh, liberalise uh, 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 this kind of quota. It seems to me that in thinking about this question, there are only two ways, two main ways we can think about it. What would one ideally like and what is politically possible? And I'm always torn between the two, but in fact, if I have to choose between those two, I think in an area like this, the politically possible is the one that one should concentrate on. And anyhow, the one that ideally I might like would have to have a provision for the Navy trying to rescue asylum seekers leaving Indonesia, which even my, my saying that shows you how unlikely it is given the atmosphere in this country at present. Now, I want to make, uh, this will just have to be telegraphed points which I would defend if I had time. Um, regarding those on Nauru and Manus Island, I think one has to argue for very swift processing, for humane solutions to those to be found to be refugees, which rules out New Guinea or Nauru or Cambodia, all of which are grotesque solutions and I believe one could gradually allow those people to come to Australia if found to be refugees and indeed allow them to come to Australia if found to be in danger if not even if not refugees which is a slightly different question. Regarding the 30,000 presently on bridging visas this is where I, I have what I think to be a new thought in a way. Um, the 30,000 on bridging visas are treated abominably, cruelly, with a very complicated set of provisions. You, you, you've just talked about them. Now, this is a new point, which I'd like everyone to think about. Given that there is successful border control, these measures are completely redundant, purposeless. They are cruelty for its own sake. I don't believe the bureaucrats are cruel, but I believe that there is in politics a kind of inertia which where policies continue even when they play no role. What you are suffering is a series of failed deterrent efforts like temporary protection visas, like not having full work rights, not, not being treated as citizens. It seems to me if that single thought that with successful deterrence at the border you ought to treat those 30,000 presently in Australia 
as on the path to full citizenship, then a lot of the problem with our present policy could be overcome. I, the 2,000 Vietnamese who arrived, or Vietnamese mainly, who arrived under Fraser, I met them, they were treated as potential citizens and they've been a huge success, as have the other 100,000 that the government brought in. <coughs> The, the, there were a large number of Chinese at the time of Tiananmen Square. They were treated, they were taught, Hawke in one phrase said, you can stay, and they've all been treated as potential citizens. We should get rid of this whole set of ludicrous conditions and allow people who are here, who are going to stay, to be treated as full citizens, mainly for their sake, but also for the countries, because why would we want to fill our mental hospitals in the future? or create people who are permanently depressed or bitter. There is another point I want to make. Even those who are presently on Australian soil who were found not to be refugees should never be returned to their countries of origin if there's any danger. Because partly our, our system of deciding who's a refugee and who isn't is crude, but also, as if you read the Saturday paper on Saturday, uh, the dangers that we can't possibly predict are far too great. Now, another point I want to make, which I, is sort of, I think Julian's made a similar point, we are spending a fortune on the present policy. Uh, someone who was in this room a few months ago, Mary Crock, pointed out that it costs Australia in a year as much as the entire UNHCR budget to look after or to treat in this in various ways the asylum seekers. In my view, most of the 50 million people who are now refugees or asylum seekers uh, will not be able to find a country, but they need to be fed and sheltered and eventually hope that their countries become secure. We should spend a huge amount of money helping feed and can give shelter to the vast numbers who are presently in need. The other thing, I'm, final thing I, I would suggest, which I believe to be politically feasible, is it would be quite possible to increase the refugee quota from, from what it is now, 13,750 refugees humanitarian, I would say it's politically possible to increase it to 30,000 per year, something like that. One of my founding experiences when I was in, involved with Indo-Chinese refugees was that there was tension when 2,000 people came here spontaneously, but no tension almost at all when the government decided to bring in 10 or 15,000 people a year and 100,000 over several years. Australians, in my view, are not hostile to refugees unless provoked into it. Um, and they feel, if the government is in control, they feel calm. So that I think there is, in what I've just said, the outline of a practical program um, in which, which it does not meet various moral and legal categories but we live in a world in which many times legal and moral matters can't be met. Thank you. Uh, like the others, I'm very grateful to have been invited tonight to this um, event. Um, Robert and I have sort of shared similar views for a long time, but we've parted company or agreed to disagree in recent times. <laughs> Um, I think many people have heard my views about our present policy and I don't intend to go into any detail about them. I would say this, I would not start with an assessment of what is politically possible. That sounds ludicrously naive, but the reason for it is this. I think our political system now is so poisonous that we should not accept it as a starting point. We need to fundamentally change the politics of this country by recognising what has gone wrong in relation to this issue specifically. I'm not talking about armed rebellion. I still think liberal democracy work fine enough, but on asylum seeker policy in Australia, it's been a catastrophe. Uh, just think about the last election, the federal election last year. It is the first time in Australia's political history when both major parties have tried to win political favour by promising cruelty to a particular group of human beings. That is a, an appalling indictment on this country. It should never happen again, and it should never be accepted as the starting point for any attempt to reform the treatment of people who come here asking for our help. Um, the, the, you know, I mean, I was very interested in Harry's economic approach to this. Um, I think the difficulty with economic theory 
uh, and I did an economics degree myself, so I remember little bits of it. Um, <laughs> the difficulty with economic theory is that it leaves out of account things that are not readily quantifiable. What is the economic cost, or what is the relevant cost to be attributed to the damage to the soul of this country when we have political parties promising cruelty to human beings who wouldn't get away with it if they promised cruelty to animals, but they promise cruelty to human beings knowing, knowing that will give them an advantage in the polls. What price do you put on that? How do you value the character of a nation which has been brought as low as that? Uh, you know, how far down the, that track do we have to go before we say, oh, that's a bit too far, Let, let's turn back and close the concentration camps and get back to being sensible? And when I say concentration camps, I mean the concentration camps in the Lord Kitchener sense, not in the Nazi death camp sense. What we are running now, don't make any mistake about it, what we are running now here in Manus, in Nauru, are concentration camps of the sort that Kitchener set up during the Boer War and which retained that character until the Nazis turned them into death camps in about 1940. Um, what price do we put on that? I would say it's an extremely high price because the character of the country is of fundamental importance to all of us, or it should be. I also have real trouble with the idea that a policy of deterrence, albeit successful, can be regarded as something which validates a policy. When you think about it, deterrence means let's make coming to Australia look nastier than standing your ground and facing the Taliban. Let's make the risk of drowning look nastier than being killed by the Taliban. That's what deterrence means. It means don't bother coming here, stand your ground and face your persecutors instead because we'll treat them even worse than they will. I don't think that's the country we want, okay? Now, let me turn to something more optimistic, an alternative. And this may not be political politically possible, but if enough of us embrace it, it becomes politically possible. Um, I don't believe in open borders. If people come here by boat, I don't oppose the idea of detaining them, at least initially. Do that for preliminary health and security checks. But cap it at one month. And after one month, release them into the community on interim visas with four conditions. One, they must stay in touch with the department so that people won't be fretting about them disappearing into the community. Two, they're allowed to work, basic human dignity. Three, they're allowed access to full Medicare and Centrelink benefits. Again, a matter of basic human dignity. Fourth, crucially, pending refugee status determination, they must live in a specified regional town or city, not in the coastal capitals. Now, when you think about it, if we take Robert's frightening number of 25,000, a number, an annual number of refugees which must seem awfully attractive to Lebanon, who've taken one and a half million Syrians in the last year, 25,000, a very modest number, uh, it was a spike. It was a spike which, uh, you know, follows our line tracking parallel to international refugee movements. It was a spike in numbers which has never been seen before. Not, as Mehak says, because we're a gorgeous place to come, but because people want to survive. Okay, so let's suppose 25,000 a year becomes the new normal. Let's suppose you have 25,000 people a year willing to risk their lives getting on a boat and crossing to get to Christmas Island. And let's suppose every single one of them stays on the dole for the entire time. These are highly unlikely assumptions, but let's make those assumptions. What would that cost us? $500 million a year, all of which would be spent in the failing economies of regional towns and cities on food, accommodation and clothing. <coughs> what are we spending now? Mary Crock's figure is a bit optimistic actually. We're spending about five billion dollars a year mistreating people. And most of that goes to offshore or multinational corporations who engage in cruelty. We are deliberately, willfully, knowingly, purposefully damaging human beings at a cost of five billion dollars a year. For one tenth of that amount, we could do some good for them and we could do some good for the economy of regional towns and cities. Which would you prefer? If you think that solution is at least attractive, get onto your local politicians and persuade them that it's politically desirable. Mm -hmm.